I think that maybe started my like love affair with Luigi. Like I've always kind of been a big Luigi fan more than Mario. Like back when I first got the NES. You should probably edit this out. Later. <laughs> <laughs> it's a love affair with Luigi. This week on Backward Compatible, get to know our special guest and favorite film buff, Ben Miro, as we continue last week's discussion on adaptation and the differences between games and film. How do their forms affect the way they tell stories? The BackwardCompatible.com podcast starts right now. Hey, Backward Compatible listeners, this is Chris, and we're here for the BackwardCompatible.com podcast number five. Um, Richard is out today. Uh, he's doing family stuff, so we have a very cool substitute in um, Ben, Ben Miro. He was actually a, uh, a sort of a founding member of the Backward Compatible crew um, and had to drop out because life is life and stuff. He abandoned us. Yeah. <laughs> I moved on to greener pastures. Yes, he did. <laughs> and I, I'm sure he doesn't regret it. I'm on ForwardCompatible.com. Forward Compatible. <laughs> So we're, while we're living in the past, he's living in the future. So uh, Ben, how about you uh, introduce yourself? I, I am uh, the aforementioned Ben. Um, I have gone to school with these guys, known these guys, worked with these guys on, on uh, different projects and, and, and school things, and uh, we formed a sort of a, a unique camarader- uh, camaraderie, you could say, and um, all have different points of views on games and media and things like that. and. Uh, here we are. Yep, here we are. Um, and we're actually, today we're having an actual uh, proper pubcast. Uh, we've always carried the pubcast uh, concept with us. Um, the idea that we're trying to keep it casual, just kind of have a conversation with friends. Uh, but today we're in the, uh, the Fillmore Pub in downtown Plano, uh, Texas. Yes. And uh, one of our personal favorites. And uh, if you're hearing the screaming baby in the background, that's because this is, this is authentic. We're, we're, actually we're, actually, we're actually in a pub. This we is... wouldn't actually go back in and edit in screaming baby in the background. <laughs> or would we? That, I was going to say that that was Richard. You know. <laughs> Richard's just upset he's not here today. Mm-hmm. So, um, so yeah, so I'm Chris, and we're here with Jim. Hey, I'm Jim. And, of course, you've met Ben already. Yep. So, uh, and uh, speaking of uh, us being in the pub here, what are you drinking uh, today, Chris? Uh, we're all drinking, well, me and Ben are drinking uh, Velvet Hammers. Um, um, it's a local brewery, um, Pedicolas. Yep. Pedicolas, however they pronounce that. <laughs> All right, well, I'm drinking uh, Roman Cokes. Roman Coke? Yep. Cool, cool. Not a bad choice. Not a bad choice. So? So. What are we talking about? We're, we're going to be talking about adaptation. Mm-hmm. Um, adaptations from films, from comics, from novels, mm-hmm. into games, vice versa. Mm-hmm. Um, other new media related, uh, transmedia, cross media properties. Sweet. Mm-hmm. And just kind of a warm up, we can talk about maybe um, sort of like what we did last time. What are what are the ones that we think have been the most successful or that we think are the most interesting yep. adaptations? Cool, cool. Ben, do you have any that, that kind of stand out for you? Adaptations from what to what? Um, it... Right now, we're kind of doing anything to anything, but I think the focus okay. should be involving um, games or new media on either either one end of the spectrum or the other. Well, we were talking about Edge of Tomorrow earlier. Yeah. And it is an adaptation of a, of a I guess, a, a manga. Oh, really? Um, is it? I didn't uh, know that. Yeah. Um, however, what I thought was stronger in the film was it is the best video game adaptation that's not a video game. Huh. Uh, I mean, the movie is, is spoilers, it's, it's about respawn points. And, and yeah, I got that from the trailer. I've not yeah. seen the movie yet. And there's a lot of... I mean, the entire plot is about this guy acquiring the ability to reset the day. The day before he goes into this huge battle. Okay. And what you see... In it's the, kind of Groundhog Day-esque, but with more control. Yeah, but that's kind of a flippant description. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> Fair enough. As, as game-playing people... There's no way you can sit through this movie and not feel like you've done that before with every video game. Yeah. You've started over at a certain point. You know what's going to happen here, here, here. Mm-hmm. And you're trying to get it right this yes. time. You're trying to get to like the next save point. That's yeah. a good point, yeah. 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 And there's also a point in the film, and this is kind of a, a character spoiler, where he does this hundreds, possibly thousands of times to the point where he becomes weary. And yeah, 
the fat guy has something crush him, and I don't care anymore. Just crush him. I can't. I don't care. All right, moving on. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Well, you get to the point of video games too. Like any, especially old school games. And Jimmy might be able to speak to this. Is kind of yeah. our, our resident I'm retro guy. About that. A lot of those old school games come down to just memorizing what the level looks yeah. like. Patterns. I think, I yeah, think patterns. For, for me, there's. I wouldn't say all retro games were like this, but there's definitely. Um, Side-scrolling action games and especially shoot 'em ups, uh, shmups are like this, where it's almost like you're trying to, you're learning to play an instrument, where yes, you have to memorize yeah. the the right buttons to press at the right time at the right moment. You have to get into this kind of rhythm, and if you're not in the right rhythm, and if you break break the rhythm and you kind of lose focus for even a moment, you're dead because you die in one hit. Yeah. So yeah, I do think there's definitely kind of a metaphorical connection there. Sure. Yeah. Oh, I, I felt watching the movie for the first time that this was the best sort of uh, comment on that process of, uh, of mastering mm -hmm. video games or really anything. Yeah, yeah. You know, you, you go back to your save point and you start again. Uh -huh. And you progress a little further every time, but you always reset and go back. So I haven't seen this, the film yet, but to what extent is he able to kind of um, change what happens moving forward because I, I imagine that part of the game or the game quote unquote the, the process is him like you know encountering this thing that happens if I shoot this guy before he shoots this person then I can change what happens and so is he trying to sort of like figure out like the perfect run so to speak no um it's basically like storming the beach at Normandy okay that's the setting okay, okay. um an alien force um, he is a non-experienced soldier, mm. first time in combat. Okay. So he died the first time. He dies right away. Mm. He absorbs this ability, which I won't give away why or how. Mm -hmm. And then he's able to start that day over again. Okay. And over again. The only way he can restart the day is by dying. And no one else is aware that he's doing this. No. Okay. So it's like it's like the video game. They all think this is their one time, their no, one chance to kill. No, I meant no. That's not what happens. Oh, that's not okay. Yeah, no, that's not okay. what happens. Okay. Uh, Emily Blunt's character, who, interestingly, in a in another more formulaic movie, would have been the male character. Huh. She is the tough, badass, hardened soldier, who actually had the same experience as Tom Cruise. Okay. And she is the one who trains him to master the ability and progress even though every time he resets he has to convince her again <laughs> that he's right because he's going back in yeah, time, time. Yeah. So she doesn't okay. remember anything. and she's contacting him through what like a headpiece an earpiece kind of no situation. she's on the field of battle oh she's on the field but of battle. but she doesn't know who he is when they first meet every time right okay. huh. so he wakes up on like an airfield bill paxton is a drill sergeant brilliant bit of casting uh -huh. he has to he's a uh, captured soldier he has to circumvent being put in his platoon find her on the airfield convince her that he's who he is go through exposition again mm -hmm. every time mm -hmm. um, however until he learns to do that again he sees her on the battlefield and she gets killed mm -hmm. and she's had this experience she knows what he's going through and she begins to train him to fight these things okay uh, it's it's a, it's a mind bender it's the rare, smart, big budget sci-fi. I like the concept, and one of the things for me that sells sci-fi sci or science fiction is having a strong concept that is interesting. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's big idea. That, that's that's the idea behind sci-fi. I think because it's especially old school sci-fi was always meant to be more of a. You know, it was usually contemporary, mm -hmm. and it was kind of like, what if we had this technology, what would that mean to us? And that's, yeah. I think, I what defines a lot of sci-fi. I don't know if I'd agree with your usually contemporary. Mm -hmm. I would say more the concepts were based on contemporary needs, but sure. especially yeah. going yeah. farther back to like the 50s, the sci-fi would normally be several hundred years in the future. I, I, I would say... It's contemporary in the mindset of the characters. Right, yeah. Like, it has That's to be right relatable. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, it's but, based on the, the contemporary needs and culture of yeah. the time. And relatability is extrapolated yeah. to, like, a hundred, uh, like couple hundred years into the future. Yeah. Or for nearer sci-fi, like, say, you know, cyberpunk is normally, like, only um, a, a few decades into the future. But it's yeah. still extrapolated ideas. Like Where are we going? How are we going to get there? And what are we going to do about it and, when and, we get there? And sure. what the current yeah. trends and technology say about what our future might hold. Right. And you have different sort of concepts in that. Is it going to be is it going to improve things or is it actually going to be a lot make things a lot worse? This is why Star Wars is not science fiction. Yep. <laughs> yeah, no, I agree. Star very, Wars very much is space fantasy. opera. Fantasy. It's fantasy, yeah. yeah. And which is fine, but I, I do think that there people get 
confused. They, they sort of get, they're spaceships. They sort of yeah, just because it's in idea. space doesn't mean it's sci-fi. Right, just because there's they're in space. There's aliens. There's futuristic technologies. Doesn't necessarily mean it's science fiction. Well, here's the thing, and you and I had this conversation before uh, informally. Uh, the big tell that Star Wars is not sci-fi is right in the first second of the movie, a long time ago. Oh yeah, yeah. Although. I don't know if necessarily being taking place in the in the past necessarily we're not going there. Not science fiction. <laughs> we're not going there. <laughs> it's too, it's too like, difficult. Actually, you, you do have a point because, like, for me, for instance, like we've we've had sci-fi around long enough that if we read like an old school science fiction story, it is in the past for us. Yeah. You know, it's like 1960s esque sort of setting with you know some new technology involved. But it's well, always it's always seems to be in, like written either for the modern day, whatever the readership is of that day, or it's written for like it's it's set in the future. Very seldom do you have that sort of past setting. I, w I would say that time machine. I mean, any sort of like well, time, time machine, machine related. But, any but, time but then time related. machine is usually built in the present day, though. Correct. And I would say there's no way as a writer to write about any other cultural civilization. I mean, you have to be writing about people's concerns now. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you could be projecting the setting and the characters into the future. Sure. What, what I find interesting, too, speaking of, we mentioned time machines in general, but the actual time machine story and the way that it, when it was adapted to film, what they did was, even though the film was made in the 60s, for, I'm talking about the original time, the yeah, time machine. I, yeah, I, um, it's great. I love the it. The book was written in the 1890s, I believe. Yeah. And so when they made the film, the setting of the film originally was the 1890s. Mm -hmm. So it kind of goes against what you were saying, where the time machine is the contemporary period. They decided to go to kind of keep with what the film was doing, only they reimagined some of the concepts in the film based on the 1960s version of what they thought the future might hold. Right. So it was really kind of an interesting huh. um, take on the concept of time travel. I, I suppose, like, actually, when you put it that way, uh, Fallout did a similar thing where you know it was a game made in like the 90s and the 2000s depending on which iteration you're looking at right but they had like 1940s 1950s era sort of sci-fi imaginings yeah um, so yeah you're right is actually. there is there right. ever a um, time travel or future story where everything's okay in the future it seems like the commonality in all of them <laughs> the future always, always fucked horrible. up yeah, yeah. The, <laughs> I mean, even Back, back, to, the, the future. back to the Future, yeah. but, but it, but it but, goes with this idea of we can fix it, make make the, the, the future be better, and they do. Yeah, but there's still like things like um, Jaws 19 or whatever, you know, mm. it's still like in, in this very like homogenized well, future. We gotta get everything. started, by the way, it, making it, Jaws movies, and we're gonna reach 19. <laughs> like, what is it, like like 2016? We have no, to reach like it, Jaws. It's, it's uh, funny it's that you mentioned that. 2015. We gotta get going. We're, yeah. we're way behind on Jaws films. We have no like holographic uh, billboards either. We don't have hoverboards either. So God oh. damn it! <laughs> it's funny That's that you mentioned that actually, because you know it tends to be that every time we go into the future in fiction, the future is bad, and it has to be about like what can we change today to make sure the future doesn't turn out bad. Yeah. It's also not true either. Um, the fifties, I think that changed actually as time went on, because back in the fifties they had this very idyllic view of the, of the that, future. That is very true. Utopian. That is true. Like our, our generation was yes. right was right. Raised on, but in the 80s, yeah. we switched to this concept of, of the dystopian future. Yeah, oppressive and corporations, oppressive governments. Right. Here's we, my idea. Yeah. Here's my idea. This is the story we need to tell or make. We need to have a, a time travel story where the time travelers go in the future, everything is great and wonderful, and they decide they need to go back to the present and fuck it up. <laughs> <laughs> because it, it's too good. It's too nice. <laughs> it's too nice. Everything's too good. Um, so... But yeah, it's funny that you mentioned that because I also noticed that more often I see in fantasy this idea of kind of escapism. And my thought is that like if you have a time yeah. machine, you travel to the future, and it's awesome. Hey, I don't want to go back to that old world. You know, this was horrible. I'm gonna stick around here. I'm gonna stick around here. That's also um, the time travel idea too. Because and, I think and, well, uh, oh, sorry, but ahead. that that was no. that was the whole plot behind um, Final Fantasy Tactics uh, for the Game Boy Advance. Was that oh, you travel God. to this fantasy? Yeah, Jim. Jim is going to be upset about this. I know. I yeah. am. Well, because, <laughs> because I got annoyed with this game. Because yeah, the whole but, concept of this game is that you go into this. Okay, the world. I don't know if you. I, used, I don't know if you played then uh, Game Final Boy's Fantasy Tactics. No. Um, Game Boy Advance, actually. It's the oh, advanced, sorry. advanced version. Advanced. All right, okay. science fiction. Already. Graduated. So, essentially, you travel to like the world. You're, you're friends basically with like you know you're a kid and you're friends with a couple of other people and they all, all their lives suck. 
One of your friends is a paraplegic. The other one that is an, it definitely comes qualifies. From, comes from an abusive home, if I remember correctly. Yeah, I think you're right. Or they imply it; they yeah. don't actually say it. Yeah. And so they all and like the other one, and like all of them are kind of poor. So that none of them are really in a great situation in life. So something happens where they basically get tr transported to the Final Fantasy world of Ivalis. And in this world... With those haircuts? Yes. <laughs> oh. with haircuts, with the, well, here's the thing. The paraplegic can now walk again. All the people that were poor, they now have jobs as like these like, like mercenaries in stupid. Final Fantasy. They might look stupid, <laughs> but guess what? They're happy. They have more money. They're in this world. No one is unhappy in this world, by the way. All of the people, even though some people were transformed into like... Um, Beast men, like human animal hybrid type creatures. Yeah, they're like good with that. Creatures, they're, but they're fine with it. They're like, screw it. You know, there's yeah. other ones. Like, you know, I may be a bunny man, but there's this like really attractive bunny girl over here, so I don't care. <laughs> yeah, you know, like, I'm, sure. I'm here. We're, we're here together. So it's cool. Your, your quest in this game as the main character, as one of the kids that transported, you're the only one that remembers the way that it used to be. And you are going, you're trying to make the world go back to the way it used to be, even though every well, single you know person what? You're in the a world, fucking asshole. Exactly. <laughs> actually, more, more to your point, you're actually not the only one who remembers. Everyone else remembers, Oh, that's too. true. The other kids do when you talk, because yeah, they yeah. pretend like they don't initially. You're, 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 right. you're the only one who wants to go back. You're right, yes. You're right, because they do remember. You're actually right, because initially at first, when he encounters them, they, they act like they don't, or some of them do. But then, you, then it turns out that they do remember. They're like, "Why would I want to go back? I My like, life sucked." I like the conceit that the player character is just a fucking asshole. <laughs> but in order to beat the game, you have to do it. It's yeah. so lame, and I, I hated myself because I'm thinking, "Let him be a bunny be man." Yeah. I don't care. I, I'm, run, I'm ruining all their lives. Like, <laughs> especially the kid who was like the paraplegic, and I'm thinking. Why does this? Why do I want to take this away from this guy? Yeah. There's no reason. It's not doing me any favors. Right. It's not like my life is going to get better by doing this either. Right. I'm just doing it apparently to screw over all my friends. Nice. Yeah. Yet somehow I mean, they kind of go along with it. It, at the it end was there. it was a cool game, and yeah, I mean, like I, I don't remember the story like fresh, but I mean, it, it basically is. It's a commentary on escapism, and it's the idea that like you know you can't really run away from your problems. You know, like this isn't the quote unquote real world. But they did run away from their problems. They, they did. Succeeded. It's and like they that... succeeded. Yeah. So it's it's well, an interesting also, commentary. Sort of the 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 meta stratification of that, of that story being presented in a video game, which is... Two gamers yeah. who are escaping by playing yeah. this video game. And what is the... That's a dick move, too. What was the name <laughs> of the, um, the, mat the the Matrix character that was the traitor? <laughs> uh, the one who, like, with the stake and everything? Yes. Yeah. God, that stake looks so good. Yeah. It's the only thing I can remember about <laughs> that movie. But the idea being... I remember... The, I totally remember the guy, way the guy looks. I can't think of yeah. the character's name. And actually, Chris, you might Joey Pants is his can. nickname. But. I, I, I want to say, like, Axel or something. I'm not well, sure if that's Right. You I'm might want to look it up. Yeah, it's 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 been a while since I've seen it's it. It's Joe. But while while Chris is looking that up for us, um, the, do you want him to look it up? Yeah, I want to look it up. Um, but yeah, like the idea is that he kind of realized that even though they're in this fantasy space, it was much better than their reality. Yeah. And because it was perceived as real, it for all intents and purposes was real. That and, steak looked pretty fucking yeah, good. Yeah, and it also tastes good. And he, yeah. he talked about it. He said it tastes the same, smells the same, looks the same. Why should you care if it's not actually real? Cypher. Cypher. Thank you. We've got you, the name. Beat me to it. All right, um, Cypher. Thank you. <laughs> you know, uh, the, right for the, smartphones. The, the weirder pull that I have along those same lines is, and, and I just watched it recently, embarrassingly enough, Star Trek Four with the space whales. Oh, God. I love, hey, I love <laughs> I, that movie. I love that movie. Voyage Home. Yes. The Voyage Home. I love it. Uh, unabashedly so. If, if you if you do like a slingshot around the sun, you travel back in time. Apparently, when you Who see knew? your own head, Who like knew? like alabaster versions of, of your head will just sort of melt away in that oh, time that's travel. And, and now we know that this is how we do it. So <laughs> I don't know why know. NASA has not gotten on this funding. Um, <laughs> funding. Their the, funding has been cut. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, um, but one of the character beats that I love about that movie is the sort of nothing female lead in that movie, Catherine Hicks, the uh, marine biologist. Yeah, the marine biologist. I love yes. that her character, at the end, is like, yeah, fuck living in 1986. I'm coming with you on the spaceship. I'm going to live in the future. <laughs> sure. You know? Yeah. Without any hesitation. Yeah. I love that sort of... But the future in, in Star Trek 2, at least, um, is awesome. as it had been imagined by Roddenberry, was this really idyllic, yeah. like, almost perfect place. Well, 
it, it changes as the Star Trek lore continues, which I think is fair, but definitely as it was originally intended, it was definitely a, well, to, he, to go back to the ideas of the future in the 50s and 60s, it was meant to be this idyllic, look at where yeah. we can go if we well, this is, take it's the right the, path. It's the Jetsons versus Blade Runner, basically. Yeah. Well, this is something that if, if, if we might get a little bit political without getting too crazy. Yeah, sure. Um, it's one of the arguments I have with my right-leaning friends is, mm. is I will often say, no, liberals aren't trying to, you know, yoke you to a radish field. Um, liberals, progressives want Star Trek. Gene Roddenberry was a liberal, and this was his idea of what we could achieve as a civilization, as a society, working together to a common goal of furthering what humans can achieve. But, yeah. but and as one of your right-leaning friends, you know, I'm one of those people who, like, I, I totally identify with that. Like, you know, I, I don't think that liberals are all inherently, like, you know, crazies who want, like, you know, whatever. We won't get into it now. But the point being that, like, I can identify with a lot of your guys' sort of, like, stances, you know? It's like, I might not agree with, like, the execution, but I think we all well, see the same but, problems and want to solve them. See, somehow. I was going to say, actually, with the, um... There's no bigger government than the Federation, by the way. Yeah, yeah actually. That is and true. No, and that is thing, true. The thing that I like about the... the as, as the world of Star Trek and the future of Star Trek got expanded by later writers, they did a really good job of addressing these points, because, for example, they go back and they, and they show that there was... They didn't go from right. the, the society that we have now to the idyllic future. No, you're right. They, they went had through this a, middle point that was basically shit. hell. Yeah. It was like World War Three. Yeah. People were like, <laughs> come on. Yeah. The idea of like the terrible dystopian future. Yeah. Hold on a second. It was there. How do Sikhs become global conquerors? What shithole is that possible? See, oh, uh, well, it's... Con, con, I actually, con is actually, a Sikh. Yes, I actually know a few was, Sikhs, so I mean... He, <laughs> are, they, are they mad, hungry, no. uh, genetic... Yeah, he was exactly. Also, yeah. He was also genetically... And he also had, like, he had different... Um, <laughs> what a weird group of people yeah, to decide to genetically yeah. that, that enhance. That is kind of weird. I, I, think, I think it's kind of like taking... Those guys. I, I think it's taking, like, the philosophy and or writings of a group and sort of saying, like, in the world that they think would be quote-unquote perfect... How would they behave? And right. What does that lead to? No, I to? think I think there's. And, I mean, all, all the fiction is speculative, but yeah. sci-fi especially. There's this. Yeah. There, there was that trend in, in Star Trek where they took concepts from from existing cultures in the modern day, and then extra like considered what if an alien race had si a similar culture because it's easier than just coming up with your own. And they did that for a lot of cultures. The Klingons, of course, being one of the big ones. Uh, the what cult culture were they modeled on? Klingons? Yeah. Spartans, Japanese. I would think. Japanese, Japanese Spartan, but really? yeah. Yeah, definitely. They had a very, like, especially especially the... Code of Warrior's the, Code. The, the, war the Warrior Code. The Bushido. Yeah, they had... But the thing that, that was great about them was that really you only had Worf in the next generation that was the idyllic version so of the Warrior's Code. Most of them were complete... Most of them were the actual way that the samurai actually were, which was they had this one concept of warrior's code and the way that, you know, like all these different, like honor and honoring honor above all else. Whereas most of them really were just kind of scumbags that would kind of abuse the, the people in the lesser, the lesser yeah. like social classes, which is really how it was back in the day. We have this this different view, this romanticized we, we, concept. We, we always have uh, ideals of any given social role, I think, you know, we, I it's mean, romantic. It's a romantic, e e even yeah. our, even our government here in America is like, you know, we're all about like, you know, rule by the people and all this sort of stuff. And yes, we, we probably do it better than like, you know, dictatorships in South America or whatever, but we still have our flaws, you know, and a lot of, yeah. a lot of our perceptions are based on, no, our government is perfect. <laughs> it, it, it's, it's, it's purely perfect. Well, <laughs> the, problem, the problem with that is, and, and we're getting way, 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 way off track, but yeah. the problem with the populace here is we like to point at the government go, oh, look, they're fucking everything up. I'm bitching, but that's all I'm going to do about it. Yeah, exactly. I mean, True. Wh whichever True. side you're on, you know, like, yeah. it's, it's all about complaining about who's in the presidency and not actually doing anything. Right. And, and they're also unfortunately controlled by corporate interests and lobbyists, lobbying groups. Which we allow. Which we do allow. Yeah. Yes, very true. So, um, but we should probably get back to the games and new media. Yeah, it's back to games so, and new media. Uh, <laughs> Enough of us depressing real world stuff. Let's is, get back to it. Is <laughs> so, Miss Pac Man, Bo, no Bo? <laughs> no, she, see, the trick about that is actually it's, it's, it's really ingenious. See, Pac Man, there's really only one Pac Man, but then he cross dresses as Miss Pac Man. Is that how In it the Miss Pac Man series. Ah. Did you He's know the that the, the ghosts Brilliant. are 
a fraction of a second slower in Miss Pac-Man? Really? No, I have no idea. I just made that up. <laughs> just made that up. <laughs> I actually used to play back in back in the, back in the day in the arcades. Yeah. Didn't so, play Pac-Man that much, but I played Miss Pac-Man no. all the time. So kind of our, our main topic of discussion for today, which we've been touching a little bit on right now, um, is the idea of transmedia and adaptations and kind of like taking a story that's presented first in one medium and transferring it to another medium and kind of like what do you lose, what do you gain. We talked a little bit about this last time, kind of as our warm-up yeah. discussion, um, but since we got Ben here and he's kind of our, uh, our resident like film, theater, um, everything but games new media. Yeah, yeah, new, new everything media. Everything but games. He, he, he's the new media in our games and new media on Backward Compatible. Um, we just wanted to sort of elaborate a little bit more, I think, on what it is that um, makes new media tick and what it is like, you know, about adaptations, you know, kind of what mediums work for which sort of story, if that makes sense. I think that um, one of the things that I, I've been thinking about lately is we can never get like too far away from narrative conceits. Mm. Like, the, the social contract between all of us as human beings is that we recognize this trajectory of a story that mirrors our life. Sure. You yeah. know, birth, yeah. life, death. Mm -hmm. You know, and every story sort of falls across that spectrum. Yeah, yeah. Um, Even back to ancient myths and stuff like that, you know, yeah. it's all about what it is to be human. Yeah, well, and, and monomyth is very much that sort of cycle. Yeah. Um, there, is that, there is that element of rebirth in a lot of the in a lot yeah. of monomyth, especially in, uh, and in myths as, in general. Indigenous cultures, you know, that's very yeah. you know huge because they were much more cyclical than sort of progressive, right? In a way of speaking. Um, so, like, I think about new media and like, where do we go? What are we striving for? Um, within that sort of framework, there are billions of variables. To make things new and refreshing, um, you know, this is sort of my issue with Shakespeare is that I feel like consigning ourselves to telling these same stories the same way over and over again, and it doesn't matter if you're, you know, having Hamlet on a submarine in <laughs> space. Yeah. Um, it's the same story. It is, yeah. And it, it ties into the um, the sort of like modern dress Shakespeare plays people put on nowadays. Yeah. Where it, it's the exact same lines, but they just happen to be wearing like you know, you know, three piece suits instead of the, yeah, know, they're in um, Elizabethan Victoria, Southern or California, or something yeah. like that. Yeah. Um, the like neck doilies. Right. <laughs> neck doilies. Yeah. Neck doilies. Those are nice. <laughs> um, yours is ravishing, by the way. Yeah, it is. I'm, I'm wearing it right now. You can't see it. It's, <laughs> you can't. Um, it's beautiful. You're sweating like a pig. <laughs> it's nice. Um, it's yellow in my neck oil. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, so so I, I, how do we take these, you know, sort of ingrained patterns of narrative and recontextualize them for modern humans? Yeah. How do we do that? Yeah. Is it games? Is it movies? Uh, I don't think those are analogous things. I don't think I, I, games yeah, and movies. I, agree. I don't think so either. Yeah. Even and though people in the gaming industry, by the movies or by the games they put out, <laughs> seem to disagree. I agree. And, well, and that's actually what I was yeah. going to say. Actually, is that I do think there's definitely a push from some in the game industry where they think that games are just an extension of, of cinema. Yeah. And so they, they really take kind it, of a cinematic event on it. Game developers are very much influenced by the media they consume. So they consume other games, for one. They consume a lot of movies. Some of them consume comics, that sort of thing. Um, not many people necessarily, you know, read as much as we used to. I mean, our society is more of a, you know, TV, film-based culture. I, I want to be careful when you say that not to make it sound like you're talking about every game game developer. Oh, for sure. Not, and def I, definitely not. I definitely, definitely. think that, that even though there's some that, that it's... You know who you are, but, though. <laughs> you haven't touched a book in years. You know who you, you are. You son yeah. of a bitch. Um, but I do think that it, that is important to to make the distinction between someone that is influenced by a movie and makes a game based on that influence yeah. versus I, someone that wants to make a cinematic experience out of a game. There's, there's a key, there's there's a key there. thing here, though. Um, you keep saying somebody, like one person makes a game, and that's just... They don't. Well, not so. true, but... These the, are all 
very corporate enterprises. Right, but the designer, or sometimes multiple designers, mm -hmm. they sometimes have two or three, but there's usually not very many. There's usually there's only there's a few usually designers. Uh, they, decide, yeah, yeah. They, they decide the, the general concept of the game itself, and uh, they're the ones that are making the call. But uh, on, on AAA games, there's a team of producers and designers and stuff like that right. who determine the general But it's still a few, only a few. Yeah, Out of like, it, the entire team of yeah, like 100 it's, people. It's not the whole 200 person studio right. deciding that we should make the game this way. Yeah, but there's a corporate mechanic on top of that that's like, oh, you want to tell the story of a flower being grown in a pot? No. Give me Space Marines. That's true, yeah. Um, I mean, because yeah. you do need to sell get uh, copies. That's there's, what it does come down but to. But there's the same, the same sort of thing that, that goes on in film as well, where if you come out and you say, I want to make this film about, you know, like, you know, whatever small concept. No, we want you to make one about giant robots because that sells. No, a space but, marine blooming but in a pot. you can't actually go make that movie yourself nowadays. And you can do the same thing with games in the indie If space. you know code. Yeah. Or you know someone that does. And that does happen. That's, that's where the indie space kind of grew out of, was a couple of people got together and said, we don't want to... But is there, and this is, I, I'm asking a question, I'm yeah. not making an argument. Um... In games, can you have made an indie game like that? And I'm thinking about Ryan Johnson, yeah. who made indie movies, like legit indie movies, like yes. Brick, now is directing Star Wars. Yes. Does that happen in games? Um, you can get a job in the industry based on your indie work. Uh, for, for example, I know that, that I want to say they originally did it as a mod, but the people that, that um, were behind an original mod concept of Portal. Yeah, Portal. Um, and that's going to quote yeah. that too. Or and cite that too. I, I think, I'm not sure if they did it, I don't know, you can correct me, Chris. Yeah. If they did it based on a mod of, of one of the of the Half Life engine, or if it, if it was their own kind of engine. I, I don't but, remember if it was like a Half Life engine or whatever else. Right. Um, I do remember, though, that. Portal was a student project. Yes. And Valve and, saw yes. it and bought those guys essentially. And then they brought them in to make Portal, yeah. the game, which which made a, which got a lot of critical acclaim in the game industry. I don't think it the original made that much money, but it got a lot and, of critical acclaim. Unless I'm misremembering too, I think Portal's actually part now of the Half Life universe. Yes. It so is. they they reference they link the, they, they, they reference Black Mesa and it's like mm -hmm. a, a competing company Aperture is, mm -hmm. and it's like I, theoretically in Half Life Three we could have Portal guns as a game mechanic yes. in Half Life Three. And who and who is the? This is just one example because I know I know that there's a lot of, of indie developers that even if maybe they're not being hired by larger studios, sometimes their projects will get picked up by bigger companies. I know that, for example, um, Sony has done some some to help fund indie companies to yeah, yeah. let them develop for the, the PlayStation PlayStation uh, Vita mm -hmm. or for the well, for the PSN. I think it, it's a PlayStation well, and, and some of those projects too have turned out to be uh, PlayStation Plus kind of exclusive free games yeah. where these indie developers make a small little game that they make available for free to anyone who wants to play it and you can download and play those games. Here's Not to mention that with Steam they give you this, this opportunity to publish uh, kind of a self-publishing but really you're going through Steam. The green light process? Yeah, the green light process which has become a lot easier. I know that I have a, I have a couple of friends that the green light process was originally a lot harder to go through mm -hmm. and they've made it a lot easier. Yeah. It used to be the way that it would work was that if your game got green lit it was a, a big accomplishment, and suddenly you were like one of the few games that had gotten greenlit, yeah. and so you got a lot of attention. Now, almost every game gets greenlit, so there's kind of this like flood in the market of indie games. It's mm. kind of a recent development. Not not every game, because for, for every one it's, that gets greenlit, there's uh, still a bunch yeah, that don't. Honestly, though, I can up. tell you at, at, from following this and also from it, talking to It is with a lot guys, easier, I'll give you that. It is significantly easier. Yeah. It used to be they had a game that got a lot of attention, a lot of press in. Various like indie mags, and they were they were kind of self selling it off of their site, mm. and they had a lot of trouble getting it published. Even though they had a complete game that had like many hours of gameplay available. Whereas nowadays, games get greenlit when they're not even close to completion. That's a good point. Literally yeah. not even close to completion. And I, so I, it's a big difference between the way it used to. Be. And to reference, you know, and we'll give it to Ben has a point here in just a second. But to reference a point that we made last week, you know, the Kickstarter effect. For all these That's games the that yeah. might not even really have anything solid to show, to sort of pitch an idea, people like it enough, yeah. they fund it, and then they do or don't make a game based on it. And who are the people that this oh, should be criminal? And a lot of people, <laughs> yeah. a lot of people that are doing this, by the way, are people from the big game studios that we were talking about before that, that don't like the fact that they have someone over them saying, "You can't do this game." Yeah. So you, we have a lot of designers from other studios. I know Tim Schafer is being one of them, um, who has said, "Well, I want to do this game. Screw you. I'm going to go through Kickstarter, get my funding, and make the game." Yeah. And sometimes that can be a cool thing. I mean, Kickstarter is not inherently bad. 
but it has it has been abused. It has been abused quite significantly, yes. and it's a bit of a problem. Potato salad. Potato guy. salad. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Come on. That's the biggest one. And the actually, fact that I actually heard him that. interviewed on local radio recently. Yeah. The and, fact that um, people defend that annoys me he, he, so much. He's, he's basically like justified it by turning it into sort of a charity case. Sort oh of thing. yeah. And I mean, it's like okay, cool. It's like if you've had the success that you weren't expecting. I mean, I respect the guy for trying to do something interesting and useful with it. But still, the whole concept of raising money on like Indiegogo or whatever. He should give that money back to the people. He yeah, should, that, he I mean, should. He should donate one hundred percent of it because, yeah. well, except for like the twenty bucks it took him to actually make the potato salad. Right. Yeah. He should donate <laughs> all of it to some sort of. Charity. It doesn't take twenty dollars to make the potato salad, by the way. It takes less. This is actually. really yeah. nice. I've made potato salad. <laughs> it, yeah, it a takes a really, really good like grade A potato I'm salad. I'm giving him credit when I say twenty bucks. Yeah. yeah. My point is, he should be donating almost one hundred percent of that because he doesn't deserve jack. Yeah. Fair enough. That's, I mean, it's a goof. Yeah. I, it is. I don't think you... Well, whatever. It caught on as like kind of an internet meme for yeah. a while. Yeah, yeah. Unfortunately. Yay, internet. Capricious. Um, <laughs> no, my, my, my point was that... And it's just, again, me speaking from complete ignorance about the gaming industry, but, but from... I do know film. Yeah. And, like, when we talk about film, we use proper nouns. Spielberg, Hitchcock. When Hitchcock is yeah. doing this, <laughs> when Spielberg's doing this, or, you know, when J.J. Yeah. Abrams that, goes that, and That do- is less prevalent in gaming. Because we, we, we talk about studios and not people. Yeah. But yeah. There are some people we talk about in the game industry. Like, Kojima yeah, but is an if you example. Talk, a, talk about them Miyamoto. to me. Miyamoto, you know him? Nope. He made Mario for Shigeru Miyamoto. Sorry. Well, most no people know Mario, Mario, Zelda, Pikmin, Metroid. That's the yeah. difference. <laughs> That's the difference. You talk about Spielberg to somebody, everybody knows who That's it is. That's fair. That's true. That's fair, but, true. but also to be fair. And I'm not, it's not a popularity thing, it's a cultural penetration but it's, thing. It's also, yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's because films have are pervasive throughout the world. It's part of our, our culture, shared cultural vernacular. Games and, and are games still aren't there somewhat yet. niche. They're, well, why? To be fair. Um, I think that it's because the game industry is still very young. It on, when you really think How about old it, is it? Well, technically, 30, 40, 50 years, no, no, no. somewhere if, in that if you range. Wanted, if you want to be really technical, it, it started back in like the 60s. But to be put a number on it. To be realistic, it really started in like the mid 70s. Put a number on well, it. We'll, we'll say 40 um, to 50 years. Somewhere okay. Like that, yeah. So I'd say 40. If we say not 50, I would say 40. Okay. Mid 70s. So yeah. If we say right. the jazz singer, <laughs> which maybe is 1927. Yeah. So where were That's movies? Right. At thirty or forty, they Wait, were oh. considered like novelties. They were they were in the same no, sort of situation. No, we already had Wizard of Oz, Although Citizen Kane. Those came out actually twenty years later. The Wizard of Oz was thirty nine, and that's from well, about ten years later. I'm saying, if games are thirty to forty years old mm-hmm. now, yeah, what is thirty to forty years from the Te- advent of film? Technically, the early film. Really, was even before that too. Yeah, it was like really more like the nation. late. I think, the late I think to your point, you know, you, you mentioned Citizen Kane, and we've talked a little bit before about like you know, gaming is still waiting for its Citizen Kane, that sort of thing. I'll tell well, you what gaming is waiting for. It's yeah. not the content. Okay, it's the criticism. That's a good point. Yeah, that is a good point. And I, I've noticed too that um, gaming has like our our cultural icons, like the things that everyone knows in gaming, just the way that people like everyone knows about movies or TV or whatever. Our games are things like Candy Crush and Angry Birds I actually yeah. hate all and Plants vs. Zombies and, and all those different and stuff. All those and are the, the problem is that yeah. being widespread doesn't necessarily mean that it's good. No. And, you know, like like you said, we're still kind of, like we, we've mentioned before, we're still waiting for a Citizen Kane. We've come close with a couple of games. But, Some people might argue that we already have it, but we don't have it yet. But the interesting thing, too, about the game, all, all three of the games that you mentioned, is are the people that play those games and almost exclusively those games don't consider themselves gamers. That's They'll, true. They will literally go out of their way to say, I'm not a gamer. But film is a medium that is meant to be mass market. I mean, games are too, but people will, like, you know, even if you don't really, like, love, well, like, yeah, you know, that's artistic what, films, that's you'll still... That's what I'm still... saying is the difference, though. It's, it's the culture. It's the difference in the culture. Like, it is film, the culture thing. Films but... are considered accepted in our culture, whereas if you consider yourself a gamer, people it's kind of a a negative it's a pejorative yeah, there's been you're wasting time yeah, yeah it's whereas with film even though it's the same thing i mean it's, it's an entertainment you're you're if you say like i'm a film buff people are not going to look down on you for saying you're a film buff but if you say yeah. i'm a, i'm a most people won't no no i would argue i, I was going to uh, supply a little anecdote sure uh, you know we just moved into our house and i put a bunch of bookshelves in our living room uh-huh. and i had books in there and they're books that I never touch, you know? I just have them up there. 
Yeah, yeah, just sort of, someone skimming your bookshelf is like, oh, you got, you see, you got such and such, it's a well, great book. Yeah. Even then, they'll be like, oh, he has all the She-Hulk trade paperback. Oh, there you go. Great. <laughs> so what I Those did, what I, yeah, they're great. Um, John Byrne. Dan Slott. Oh, uh, the Dan Slott, I was going to yeah. say a John Byron ones. Those are the only ones. Oh, sorry. Um, <laughs> um, but what I did recently is I, I boxed up all my books. Yeah. Because they're just, you know, decoration. Sort of narcissistic decoration, uh -huh. and and I put all my Blu-rays and movies in bookshelves, and my wife's like, "Why are you doing that? This is weird." And I was like, "No, because these are actually who I am. This is actually a fairer representation yeah. of what I'm into." Okay. And if these were like ancient texts and you know academic books, people hey, would think I was a genius. Yeah, yes. Well, You're that, right. that is That's fair. You'd probably be putting That's them fair. up there just for like snobbery. I think sake. it's like I know this is a book that people would look at and say. Hey, this guy's smart, but, you know, and but, not actually you. But see, that's that goes into the age of the medium because yeah. you look at literature has been around for much longer than film. Film is considered more has more artistic value or cultural value. Let's just go with cultural. Let's, let's avoid the artistic argument I, and say it's it's a, it's culture has more cultural value because it's been around for much longer and it's been a part of our culture. I would say for longer than games because so, there's an apparatus in place that has contextualized films for us. Games have don't have that yet. Yeah. Right, but. I don't think that, it, that it's they never will, it's just that it's no. going to take time. And There's not somebody, I think, who embraced criticism in games were fans. Yeah. Rather than Fair academics. Point. Fair point, yeah. Uh, I don't think games have found like their Pauline Kale or their Andrew Saris, an academic to come along and look at the medium for what it is and honestly evaluate it. I, I can't think of a game reviewer that does that. No, I mean, and, and the other issue, too, is the people, like, you know, the quote-unquote academics that come along and just take a look at games often aren't immersed in games. No. They, they, they sort of, like, it's uh, the example that I've heard put before by one of our professors was that, you know, it's, it's almost like the uh, the English looking at Africa in the late 1800s. Oh, say, hey, old man. Oh, look, at, look right. at these savages doing this strange thing. <laughs> they sort of approach it that way. They've got well, ghosts where, chasing where, their little yellow fellow. We, we do have a growing, growing academic community in gaming, but it's still very young and like yeah. e much yeah. younger than gaming itself. I think, I think the academic community is only at most 10 years old, right? I mean, it's only really yeah, in the last decade. Nascent. So, yeah. right. And it's so non -existent. I, think, I think that's a big part of it, too. Yeah. I think even when you look, at, look back at something like Jazz Singer, that came out about 30 years after after films had really started proper. Well, and it's been in theaters for a while. Let's uh, let's back up to like Birth of a Nation, like the first like generalized sort Even of accepted. That, there were films in. No, in but theaters. they were films of like the sunrise coming up or trains going into tunnels. Yeah, they weren't like moving fo moving but, photography. But yeah, all, through, all through the early 1900s, I mean, you know, for about 25 yeah. or so years before Jazz Singer, there were no, actually right. Birth of a Nation was like 19. They were sound films. They were yeah. sound films. Not you know, Jazz Singer was like the the big you know first. I don't know if it was really the first that had sound, talkie, but it was yeah. one of the early earliest, yeah, think, the most influential yeah. talk. Right, um, no, there were narrative films before that. But, right. Uh, but the medium the same, was. But that's the same way with games. L look at yeah. look at look at the early games that we got from like on the Atari in the early days of the NES. You could equate like those. Were they really like Nickelodeon type movies yeah. where you turned to crank and watch the sunrise as like that version like that version of Tetris or you know <laughs> Pong even or earlier. Like I would say Pong would be a better example. Yeah. Because I think Tetris had even more, like more refined controls. I mean, Pong, you look at it. But there's no story. I, I find that interesting because I, I could have sworn that a lot of those earlier systems, at least when when Pong was first coming out, a lot of the earlier systems were just different versions of Pong. Like you would just buy like this version of Pong. <laughs> I I don't remember. I know seriously. I, I remember that's, the that's slightly before my day. Ben will have to enlighten us on this. The late now. 1990s, the early 2000s. I remember there was a bit of like a fad where people were remaking Pong in their own image, oh, and God. so it was like it was like better graphics, quote unquote. Um, you know, like, you know, different mechanics. They had like power-ups and all this sort of stuff, but it was still basically Pong yeah. or like, you know, what was the game? Like Brick Breaker, Block Breaker, whatever it was. That was Breakout. Least, breakout. breakout. And yeah. that, was, that was better than Pong. So yeah. it's kind of like a Pong Breakout hybrid. What was the real that name was of that? The thing. Was it Arkanoid? No, it's not Arkanoid. Look it up. Look, look what up? Breakout. It breakout. wasn't called Breakout. They had a, a more... And the Atari version game. was Breakout, right? But the original concept, there was a different name for it. Okay. Breakout was the more... I want to say Breakout was almost the freeware version. I want to say it was Arkanoid was the original name for it. 
might be wrong on that. Dios mio. You're gonna have to look this it up. This is down the rabbit hole of nerdy. Search, search for breakout. Search for breakout. Yeah. You find it. If you if you search for breakout, you should find it. All right, let's see here. But yeah, you guys you guys keep talking. And you I'll, know, sort of, I, I'll bury myself in. Like, I think even as the old guy at the table, like the first games that I were into were the ones where you got to kill people. Yeah. Like I believe the first game I owned on the Atari 2600 was Choplifter. I never played. See. I never had an Atari 2600. I had some friends that did. This was before I had the NES. Yeah. This was my first system was the, was the NES. Yeah. Um, but I had some friends that had the Atari 2600. So I played some of the games. Like I played uh, the original Mario Bros. on that yeah. system, which was pretty fun. It was like, like Bros. it was the first. Well, it was the first. Um, it was yeah. the first versus game that I played because you're playing against someone else. Not Donkey Kong. Mario Bros. is versus, Donkey Kong's not versus. Okay. It says Mario Bros. is the first versus game. Oh, okay. okay. Like, you play against someone else. Like, I'm, like, one person's Mario, yeah. and of course, I never got to be Mario because I was, I well, was... you're totes I Luigi. Was, well, I was the friend, so yeah. I had to be Luigi. Like, if you yeah. go in the system, you get to be Mario. But I think that maybe started my, like, love affair with Luigi. Like, I've always kind of been a big Luigi fan, more so than Mario. <laughs> like, back when I first got the NES... You should probably edit this out, dude. Edit this out. <laughs> the love affair with Luigi. I'm, I'm coming out as, like, as, like an unabashed Luigi fanboy. Yeah. Yeah. But Whenever I see those overalls, <laughs> he has that scaredy cat personality. I just I love it. <laughs> but he'll willingly go into a haunted mansion. <laughs> That's what I like. So that's exactly what I'm into. The Wikipedia article for Breakout is actually citing it as being built by Steve Wozniak, aided by Steve Jobs. Totally. For the Apple II computer, which I. I but wait, wait, wait. What, what was, the was the original version, though? The original. Well, it says here. It what was, year is that? This is um, 1972 Atari arcade game Pong. No, no, he, no, he said it's influenced by. Here's the year, it's 1972. It was conceptualized by oh, Nolan Bushnell and Steve Bristow. Um, it was influenced by Pong, and it was built by Steve Wagnack and Steve Jobs. Wait, type, no, but that's Breakout. Type in, type in Arkanoid. I want to see what Arkanoid is. Arkanoid? Yeah. Got it. In, into Wikipedia, not into, like... Uh, but we've confirmed that the original name of Breakout was, in fact, Breakout. We haven't yet. On Atari 26. <laughs> we haven't yet. <laughs> Yeah. Arkanoid. 86. Ar Same arcade year. game oh, developed no, no, by came, Taito in 1986. It is. You're right, Breakout was the first in, one. Yeah, okay. Wait, what? You're right, Breakout was the first <laughs> one. I'm wrong. <laughs> it, was, it was built upon Breakout in the 1970s. But Arkanoid has right. a cooler name. Let's let's start an argument about Yars Revenge. Let's go. Yars Revenge? Come on. I know that name. Oh my god. Looking it up. <laughs> I know that name. What, 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 is, what was that game? I am Zangiefing all of y'all into I know Zangief. Game. Yeah. Of course, Should. but what is what is yours? Revenge? It's an Atari 2600. It's a video game, game released See, on for the Atari, Atari 2600 in 1982. It was created by Howard Scott Warshaw. Yours Revenge was Atari's best-selling original title wow. for 2600. See, it was just a it was just a pull. Lot. Outsold by the licensed game Pac-Man. Mm -hmm. See, I know the NES. I don't know the Atari That's 2600 yeah. as much. <laughs> I know some uh, of the arcade games back then. So I, how about I definitely e. played Donkey Kong a lot. <laughs> I had ET, and it was infuriating. Oh, Everybody I played says. It, I played it as well. It's so bad. Yeah. Um, you fall into these pits and you just can't get out. Yeah. And then that's about the moment where you turn the system off. You know what's window. It doesn't get as much press as the Raiders of the Lost Ark Atari game, which mm -hmm. was equally fucked up and crazy. I'm sure. Um, Licensed video games are never good, especially back then. But, <laughs> yeah, because they gave them to one guy, like, yeah. you know, the nerd in the closet of the studio. Hey, can you make a yeah. thing where blocks move across or, the screen? Or, like, the the, <laughs> old, the older guy in the neighborhood who would, who would invite me over to play, like, Custer's Revenge because it was... This got it was, dark real quick. Yeah. <laughs> It was like, it was like, hey man, I got Custer's Revenge. Hey. No one else has played this one. Hey little boy. Hey boy. Yeah. You ever heard of Yard Revenge? Come on, my place. This guy's got bugs. <laughs> Don't tell your parents. <laughs> it's uh, it's like the Game Grumps thing where they did uh, Dennis the Menace uh, game. Let me oh, show you God. my joystick. Yeah. Let me, I'm, I'm going to learn you how to play football. Oh, Jesus Christ. <laughs> See, you're in my basement. Yeah, this is getting really dark right now. Yeah, so... It, it's really mystifying why gamers have this terrible yeah. reputation. <laughs> We're normal. How We're does this like, happen? Right. We're just like everyone else. What are you talking about? I'm yeah. gonna go watch On Golden Pond now. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Old go On Golden Pong. On Golden Pong. Yeah. Not, not, not to be Henry confused Fonda. With, not to be confused with Golden Tea. The uh, like the restaurant arcade golf game. Yeah. It's but. like a douche magnet, like in every <laughs> bar. Yeah. With the trackball. Yeah. But yeah, the trackball, yeah. Oh god. 
It's actually, I don't know, I think I played it once when I was like 12 or something. And I mean, it seemed interesting. I don't know. Did it? It, it did. I hated it. I mean, actually. The, the, the trackball actually. Golf is not interesting. I mean, Making from, a... From, from a game design perspective, the trackball is actually an interesting um, input mechanism because it's Dude. kind of, it, it's emulating like skill. So it's not the same skill, but it's a skill. I feel like, like a golf <laughs> game is like a walking simulator or something is <laughs> I mean what do the fun part of golf is going and getting drunk you know yeah I and, mean and fucking up I not mean, being good at it I, I, I I've enjoyed my few outings with golf and I'm always horrible but it's still kind of fun I, I don't know well I, I don't know that's if the game we need to make it's like like there's a boring golf simulator no an awesome one where you like how do you make the best <laughs> you, bloody mary for the game yeah i was gonna say that all, all you would do bench is, quest go get ingredients there you go what, what you have to do is on like, the golf course yeah. the concept is that you you mix your drinks beforehand and then you drink them on the golf cart and then like the more that you drink the more like you have trouble controlling the, the driving golf game so, level. But, you know what? but you know what if you don't drink enough by the time you finish you didn't have enough fun unless, you unless, the fun versus <laughs> unless the fun there's something i'm missing on the track we have not had a golf cart racing game. Right. No. We need that. And around a golf cart. So like old people oh, being drunk. Old, old you people riding. driving a golf yeah. cart yeah. drunk. No, you have to hit old people, get points <laughs> oh, for that. Okay. Like there's the, the points. Like the, the old points game, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Drunker you get, the better you can drive mm. the golf cart. Um, <laughs> so it's like it's like Death Race 2000, but with golf carts. It is In verbal carries. abuse, you, you have caddies that you can verbally abuse. <laughs> golf cart 2014. Yes. <laughs> We're there. That's what we do. Yeah, there you go. Um... So yeah, I think we're getting a little off track of the of the adaptation discussion, though. Um, yeah, so returning to adaptation, sort of like with all this sort of like, you know, vamping aside, you know, getting getting back to the topic that we had with adaptation and like taking movies into games or games into movies or whatever, I, I think we kind of established last week that we're more fans of transmedia. Things where we tell different stories in different media where... Using the same property, right? The, the same property, yeah. same universe. Yeah. But we're telling a different story using the, the, the strengths of that medium. That's the only way to do it. Which I mean, I like that. Yeah, I like that so much better than trying to ad adapt something because you can't. You can't adapt a film to a game or vice versa and have it actually pay respect. Because if if, if you've made a great film, it only works as a film. If yep. you've made a great game, it only works as a game. And, and it's and such you a can, you can have decent sort of like game to film adaptations. Right. Where if if the story in the game is linear, yeah. you can have the film sort of show the linear story without Here, all the failures. Here's my problem, yeah. and I'll be the troll asshole. Sure. Um, the problem is they can only adapt the story. Mm. Correct. And They can't adapt the gameplay. The, yeah. yeah. And, or, or the interactivity. Oh, exactly. The interactivity being the big thing. Because and, yeah. Yeah. even if you're adapting the story, you're not adapting the ability to interact with that story and to change that story as or you can in the game. To claim ownership of it. Yeah. And, yeah. and my problem with that, just adapting the narrative of the game, is that now I'm saying most games, your triple A games, sure, sure. are entirely derivative of other movies. Fair. So yeah. Some of them, yeah. Name you know, I avoid them. I mean I avoid a video game adaptation. Mm -hmm. Name some. Well, oh, adaptations. A any any movie direct. to game direct adaptation, like yeah. you know Wolverine when they made uh, you know X Men Origins Wolverine, they made they a had Wolverine the Wolverine game, game. Yeah. and they, even then, even then, like I'll give the developers some credit, they had some, they took some initiative in trying to make the game be something different from the movie and a kind of advanced gaming, advanced you know movie to gaming adaptation. Well, but it still was just like basic, like we said last week taking the movie's plot or something that's supposed to take place before the movie whatever and adding 200 times more bad guys than you see in the movie what about the other direction game to movie game that's to movie. The, that's the thing Doom. Uh, starring starring Dwayne Dwayne Johnson yeah you talked about Dwayne, this in the last part yeah. Yeah. Rock the, the last one I saw was you know, actually uh, Prince of Persia oh yeah um, adapted to movies and it wasn't Horrible. Stop, stop. Okay, stop. stop. Oh okay. My God. <laughs> I honestly, I haven't seen it. I heard yeah. it was decent. I, I, but I haven't seen I, it. I came away with from it. And I'm a fan of sand, Sands of Time. Yeah, I gotta go I, out and say I, I like Sands of Time. I'm a fan of Sand. I, <laughs> I just in general. Did you ever, also, say anything with grains, sand in it. you know, like we, we count all the grains on the beaches I, I and all that. that. Yeah. I, I thought that the Prince of Persia movie adaptation was decent. It wasn't great, but it would like I went into it like as one of those films where I just wanted to sort of like watch sort of a fun film, and it sort of came across to me as that a fine film, fun, 
Oh, okay. Fine. Not, not <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I'm going to go watch the, uh, the Prince of Persia tonight. I do say. Oh. Maybe it looks better through monocle. Have uh, you tried? Quite. <laughs> the, the monocle, though, quite retracts, or detracts from the uh, 3D, the three dimensional films. <laughs> <laughs> that becomes so popular I lately. just, you know. You're like wimpy from the Popeyes. J I have like no. Like cartoons now? Or no I no I idea. I can't be watching any uh, Jake Jelly Hole movies. Come on. J Jake Jelly Hole? Oh, Jake, Jake, Jake Jelly. Jake Jelly Donuts. I can't. <laughs> I can't, can't be doing that. Where he's supposed to be an Arabian. Yeah. Come on. No, everyone was white. They, they said, no, but it's, it's the Prince of Persia, and everyone. Have you seen white. the trailer for the mean? Moses movie? Ben, ben, the, the ben Kingsley one? played an Indian. I mean, he's fine. Are, 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 are you talking about different. like the old school, like Ten Commandments, or are you talking about like some new thing? No, which one? Exodus. The whip. Hey. Exodus. I haven't heard of this. Ridley Scott um, directing uh, uh, yet again another uh, Moses movie. Yeah. Huh. Uh, Christian Bale as Moses. Wait, when the hell what? is this? It's, <laughs> Wait, it's I, coming I, out. I, I said, I said, cool, and I'm like, what? Like, my, it just registered in my. <laughs> you know what? I, I got, I got to tell you. And I, I love Ridley Scott, but like yeah. lately, some of his work has been questionable. Really? Yeah. <laughs> I say lately, I mean like the last decade. Yeah. But I loved him so yeah. much back his earlier stuff, but lately. No, this trailer's been popping up. It's coming out I, probably next summer. So another Mo Moses movie. Another Moses movie. I, you know, I was playing uh, Mass Effect recently, replaying Mass Effect, yeah. and you know my the original one, all three, um, all three, um, sure. um, yeah. and my wife sort of bouncing around in the background, and you know I was telling her I was playing a woman and I was playing a lesbian, and I'm just, I'm playing it again right. uh -huh. in a different way. Yeah, yeah. And I played like a, a male good guy the first time. The second time I'm playing like a female lesbian renegade. Okay. And I'm telling her about all my sexcapades and adventuring and stuff like that. Sexcapades. Yeah, especially those. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. And um, I'm gonna bed my, you know, yeoman. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> That's kind of one of my issues with Mass Effect. But go ahead. And um, proceed. And I found that she was like, "Well, you know, what's your hot female lesbian, you know?" Galaxy Saver doing today, so she was sort of hooked into the narrative through me just she, she, yeah. she's bragging. Ring, she's referring to Shepard there, right? Yeah, okay. Fem Shep. Yeah, Fem Shep. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Who, by the way, has the stronger voice acting? And I, I tend to agree, actually. Yeah, she... I, I, I've played a little bit of both. I haven't finished Fem Shep's run yet. Yeah, but Honestly, I, I've heard all of Male Shep's and Fem Shep. I mean, it's not a huge difference, but it is. It is better. It's definitely better. It was... Yeah. I don't know, like when I played Mass Effect, and I was never really the biggest Mass Effect fan, I kind of felt the voice acting was okay, but I wasn't that impressed. Did you play the, which one? I played originally playing with the guy, but I have seen some of, I've done Let's Plays with the female uh, Fem Shep, I and I honestly Fem didn't Fem. really think, don't get me wrong, like, like the Shepard character, I think yes, the female Shepard is a better voice actor, Yeah. but I'm talking about the voice acting overall in the game. Well, I didn't especially know. Also, when, I, when I went over to Star Wars The Old Republic, hearing that same voice actress. Yeah. I made my Fem Shep look really badass, though. Okay. And I think that voice coming out of my Fem Shep, I'll take the Pepsi challenge with any other <laughs> Fem Shep. Yeah, challenge. I don't know. One of my issues... One of my I issues. made her look like Karen Gillian from Doctor Who. Yeah, I think you mentioned that. With yeah. the shorn nice. head, uh -huh. like, just yeah. almost bald. All right. Oh, she looked good. I, That's I cool. really like some Karen Gillian. <laughs> but, yeah. You need to see Guardians of the Galaxy, my friend. Yeah. She's blue she was... and a cyborg. Oh, oh my goodness. Oh, damn. But one of my things with Mass Effect, I don't know, like, I think that Bioware is trying to, to kind of, like, cash in on this market of, like, the, like, you know, quote, the romantic, like, varying, like, storylines you can have with characters. And oh, they're me, complete bullshit. To, yeah, to me, like, like I got they're, the impression... They are really shallow. Well, their idea of, like, oh. their they're, idea they're, of, like, romance is, like, you meet someone, you talk to them for, like, a, you have a few conversations. You fuck and then go exact, right back to business. Yeah, yeah, exactly. yeah it's, it's total it's bullshit. It's pedantic. And I, yeah. Like, a, a better romance story, I think, in an RPG like that would be, like, Hey, like my romance is letting me think maybe I shouldn't be doing what I'm doing. Had, and then like you, you they did a, a better job with Baldur's Gate 2. I don't well, know if you've ever played Baldur's Gate 2, but they did a better job because that was Bioware as well. They did a better job with having this slower build for romance, so it made sense with the with the story they were trying to tell. Let me uh, let me just put a capper on this. I, my idea was to play this femship as like a dude. Like a like a just a strong strapping yeah. lesbian. I'm just to kind of see like how people would react I'm gonna to fuck it. everybody on yeah. this ship. 
<laughs> like a Jane, like a like a female James Bond. Yeah, like, like you're gonna be like yes. a womanizer. Not, exactly. Not, yeah. not, well, I see. No, it, I totally it, see what you're going. Yeah. You say everyone. Is that more bi than lesbian? No, 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 no. no. Every woman. Yeah, Every woman. He okay. means like a woman womanizer. Fair enough. Womanizer, but as a okay. female. A woman I, I, womanizer. I, I'm following yeah. you. I'm following you. Huh? Yeah. I totally woman, get that. Woman womanizer. <laughs> Love it. Um, and so my idea was to just like get them all. Yeah, like yeah, Pokemon, yeah. Uh-huh. gotta catch them all. <laughs> gotta catch them all. But the game doesn't <laughs> let you do that. Yeah. It is true. Once you once you have sex with the with the character, you're you're done. You're well, because you're, e- either they your dance card is well that, empty. That, at that point, it's too late in the story to change anything. But even if you like start to have like you know multiple relationships early on, they're like, oh hey, you know I'm a, like I'm a one person type of gal. You gotta you know either pick me or pick them. And what's bullshit about that from a narrative level is you're facing down the end of the world. Mm. It's very human to want to go out and fuck everybody you possibly could. To, to create children that won't be here after the world ends. Or to just have fun. Sure. Well, uh, <laughs> if, yes, but I would argue that if you're part of a team that your entire purpose in the games is to stop the end of the world, you might have other things on your mind. Yeah. You and Jim, you and I are different people. <laughs> and, yeah, all right. I agree. Like, if it, was like, it was like, hey, what's the story of like people on this planet while someone else like we have no control over like saving the world so what should we do sure fuck like rabbits who gives a shit yeah. but if you're trying to save the world maybe you have a different focus because you feel like hey i can actually do something so what i so, do in my rec so, time is my business so, so closing thoughts on adaptation <laughs> I don't think you have rec time let, let, let's, let's go to, let's go around the table and sort of get everyone's yeah. thoughts on kind of like how like we're we'll, we'll now it down to games and movies okay how do you feel about games and movies as storytelling media and how do you feel about the way they sort of deliver stories to the audience we'll start with you ben um uh, obviously i'm Pro movie. I mean, I don't think it's a pro or, or con sort of no, I don't question. Think so sure, but I think it's neither or thing at all. Personally, as a forty-year-old guy with a family, I like to go into a movie, spend my two hours or increasingly longer, and my fifteen bucks, and have that encapsulated experience done. I feel you. Yeah. Whereas playing a game and again like Mass Effect I'm putting in 30 plus hours 30 plus hours yep, that's true and and I don't feel I'm getting any more of a that's a good point actually over an experience it's a very good point because with so many more hours in that game the plot's essentially the same yeah, yeah well yeah Go. I mean I mean it's just sort of thinned out over this longer yeah. expanse of time and I always find myself sort of dreading like oh I'm walking to a room and there are a bunch of crates stacked up yeah, yeah. All right, Jim, what you got? Um, I would say I, I do kind of agree uh, with what Ben is saying. I, I, I'm a really, I'm, I'm kind of a move up myself. I do, I am really big into movies, but I'm, of course, also really into games as well. But I, I, I expect a different experience out of both. And I do think that I am actually against this, the more cinem- cinematographic, like shift in films if, yeah. that's, if that's a word if I'm creating a new word I'm not sure but I, I'm against that kind of shift into let's try to make um, the experience of a, of a game more like in the narrative experience I should say of a game more like the narrative experience of a film I think that that's the wrong way to go yep. because I think that films give you a different sort of narrative experience I totally agree and yeah, totally films agree. give you different sort of narrative experience and I think that both both mediums should embrace what makes them strongest and I think I films have had more time to kind of find out what makes them strongest yeah yeah. Games are still, or at least game narrative, is still trying to find what makes them strongest. Um, but I want them to embrace the interactivity and embrace the embrace interactive, the, yeah. um, the the concept of making making this experience the player's experience, not just the designer's experience. Yeah. I, I want games to go deeper. Yeah, sure. I mean that's. And I, and I, I think I think some have tried, and I think yeah. that like you know like some of my some of some of the strongest narrative experiences in games I would say are things like um, Planescape Torment for me. I don't know if you've played that. Tabletop. Um, Go ahead. Yeah, you've played the, the tabletop yeah. Planescape. There, yeah. There's a video game um, that came out in the uh, the late '90s. Uh, I think we're well, going to say '99-ish. Um, Planescape Torment, mm-hmm. which does a fantastic job of giving a a narrative that feels like the player is strongly involved in, in the story and in the narrative and it feels like it is through and through meant to be a game even though that game I think still still has the record for the most lines of text of any game I think it actually still is up there and yeah. if not the very top it's like up in the top five of the most um, like written lines of, of dialogue 
in a game. So they were tormenting the writer, basically. <laughs> Planescape tormenting. If you play it, you, you basically you play as a character that has lived many lives. Yeah. So gamers can relate to this because yeah. it's this thing that's where Edge he, of Tomorrow. Well, actually, it's, it, it takes a, it takes an RPG bent. He's been a fighter. He's mm -hmm. been a thief. He's been a mage. He's been all of these different characters. Like Skyrim. Yeah, in, diff <laughs> in different lives. Yeah. And so he, he comes in contact with different incarnations of himself. Uh -huh. And he has to kind of like, he has to reconcile who he was when sometimes in, in one incarnation, maybe he was... Um, Chaotic evil. Maybe in another incarnation, oh, he neat. was like a, like a lawful good person. Yeah. Who is he now? Who is he now is defined by the player. Oh, that's and how, neat. And how he interacts with his uh, with his earlier incarnations, whether it's host more hostile, maybe, maybe it's acceptance. That's up to the player too. How he interacts with his like party members, which many of them knew him in different incarnations, and some of them liked him or did don't like him based huh. on how you're acting now and how he acted then. Very interesting. So it has a really infamous kind of ripped that off. Yeah. yeah. So it's, it's, it's worth checking out if you're really into the narrative in games. And, and as for myself, stuff, I mean, nice. I, I see games and movies as two totally different media. Yeah. And both have great futures, both can be made by very good people, both can be made by very bad people. And frequently but, are. Yeah. Frequently oh, yeah. are, totally. No doubt. But, but the games have, like, you know, film is primarily visual and audio. Mm -hmm. yeah, that, that, that is its Performance. Meaning. Performance. Yeah. Games are visual, audio, interactivity. And they add a whole new sort of you know, spin on the, the storytelling medium than movies do. And I think they should embrace that. I think that games yeah. should really like understand that they are games, they're interactive, and even if they try to tell stories in the way the movies try to do, you know, Kojima is a great example of like someone who does it decently well with mm -hmm. cutscenes and with um, sort of telling stories in a cinematic way. <laughs> but he has um, an interactivity too that adds to the depth of the meaning. You know, when you are this person who's doing all these things and trying to, you know, accomplish your mission, this is essentially what it comes down to. He also tries to say something about, you know, whatever the political or whatever else. You know the, the, the situation surrounding the story because I, it's interactive. I gotta tell you, we're gonna have to dedicate some time to do nothing but Kojima talk because I have a completely <laughs> different take on Kojima. The, the, yeah. the Kojima cast. You've and, elicited my Bruce Willis squint. Yeah. <laughs> and, I'm, and I'm not against Kojima, by the way. All right, but I have right. a very different take of Kojima, especially playing some of his earlier work. Now I've been playing Snatcher, uh -huh. some of his earlier earlier yeah. Kojima work. Old, old school stuff, the yeah. adventure stuff. So yeah. we'll have to do that maybe another podcast. I, I totally agree. Talk about Kojima. I, you know, he he has his he has his good points. He has his points. That can maybe be improved a little bit. Yeah, I totally agree with you. Like what about his bad points? He's got a lot. Those? Bad he points does. too. Yes. I, I'll agree. But um, I'm not touching that stuff. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. We'll, we'll talk about it when you're not around, Ben. Thank you. <laughs> but uh, the point being that it's two very different media that tell different types of stories, and interactivity is a huge difference between games and movies, and it should be respected. But the onus is, why do games keep pulling from movies? Right, and that's something that I think that I think a big part of that is the visual audio. No, and I, I think it's also the, it's also they're trying. Games are struggling it's to appeal easy. to a mass to a mass audience. Yeah, yeah, easy. And they think that if they um, take from film, that mass audience or audiences are more likely to latch on. You know, another that's what I think. Another material sort of difference or point. Sure. Is that how much does the average game cost? It costs a lot. It a lot. Actually. <laughs> Game costs are, are going so... In fact, it's to the point now, we, we've talked about the problems with films making money. Games actually are even less likely to turn a profit at this point. I don't believe that. It's true. In Not fact, one bit. In fact, about 90% of, of uh, games don't make don't make money. That's an industry problem. That's, it is. That's, no, it is. I'm not, I'm not arguing with you. That's a thousand middlemen taking oh, I, a bite. Oh, I agree with you. I'm just saying that, that because of that problem, they're looking for every possible solution to make money. I think one of the inherent problems in the two industries is that um, the revenue bite that tells you that you shouldn't do this or that is not as immediate in games. So like a piece True. of shit game, True. fanboys will buy up, create a billion dollars, and then complain about it later when those dollars are already gone. That's true. Fair enough. And part of that, you know, we, we talked about investment before. In games, I think because it's interactive, there's a bit more investment. And people who, you know, 
maybe even like don't care about the story aspect of it will say I'm gonna buy this because I'm invested in this game and therefore this developer they've released something I'm gonna support them that sort of thing whereas in films I mean people do do that but not to the same extent no, no. I, I don't think people like God, Paramount is releasing a new movie. I gotta see those Paramount movies. <laughs> that does not yeah, exist in films. Exactly. It's always attached to a the star. Yeah. And and I'm just restricting this to big big movies. Sure, sure. And then I I would say the minority, the director. Uh huh. Or writer, producer, producer even. No. Plays into it. Uh, in you film, don't think so? name a producer you like. I can't name one off the top. Exactly. Of there you go. Exactly. Sure. Yeah. Um. I don't know. People are fans of those corporate entities and mm -hmm. games, but in film, there's not an analogous that is entity. True. You know, the thing is that some visionary, somebody smarter than me, uh -huh. needs to take games across the ocean to the other continent mm. and, we, we and already stop have, it. Yeah, we already have North America and Japan. And then Europe is basically... I meant metaphorical continent, but yeah, fine. No, fine. <laughs> <laughs> but, like, we, we have North America and Japan is because of the Big, the big Bang ones. Yeah. And then Europe and Australia are also there, but essentially they're just, like, dubs or ports or whatever yeah. of whatever's being released in North America and Japan. Right. So having... I mean, we already have some presence of Australian and European developers making games, but having a bigger presence for them and, you know, really making them a powerhouse in yeah. the gaming industry might help. Them. I think um, with European developers, I know we're getting close to, to wrapping up, but I yeah. think with European developers, one of the ones that I really like, um, CD Projekt Red, I believe is their full name. I, I heard of them, yeah. The ones that did the Witcher series, uh -huh. and currently the the current game that they're working on. Unplayable game. Um, I liked it a lot, actually. Really? Yeah, no, I think they've been, they they make them intentionally. Um, it's hard. It's a little bit obtuse at first. It's hard to. Witcher get Two is better. Yeah. I, I would say go yeah. start with Witcher I did. Two. Did you? Yeah. Um, they're making Witcher. Th it is very a very like retro feel to them, in my opinion. Like yeah. they're, they're very. They expect you to figure it out for yourself. Yeah. Go for it. Um, Witcher three is coming out re like pretty in, in about half a year. I want to say pretty soon. That might be right. Yeah, is it about right? About, sounds like about. early 2015, right? Google it, motherfucker. Or, or Google late 2015. It. I don't know. <laughs> I want to say it's early, but I could be wrong. Sometime in 2015. Yeah. Um, the other one that they've been, they, they've been plugging since 2012, um, it's it's relevant because I've been doing like a cyberpunk, I've been going back and looking at cyberpunk games. They're doing one called Cyber I like your upgrades, by the way. Oh, yeah. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> Cyber, cyberpunk 2077 uh, is the current one they're working on. Oh, I heard about that, yeah. Yeah, and they're basically taking um, the Blade like Blade Runner um, concepts, of course, from the city, because they like the city. Have you played, or, or have you, um, oh jeez, have you played uh, Shadowrun? Yeah. Yeah, tabletop. So yes, but honestly, I think that Cyberpunk twenty seventy seven is a little bit more based on Shadowrun in terms of the concept of the world. But they're designing the city after Blade Runner, what, like yeah. some of the visuals in Blade Runner, which are very clear in the screenshots they've shown so far. Again, that's so it's really more of like Shadowrun with like a Blade Run. Goes back to my scan. point of like games always pulling from movies rather than staking their own. Yeah, no, but I think I think it's it's different if you're pulling concepts from world building versus concepts from narrative build, it's different. World building is about the visuals and what you use to fill the space out and, ah, and, the, and the audio. That, that's a that's an entire podcast. On the next episode. <laughs> In fact, you know what? Let's go ahead and let's let's commit to next time. Talk about world let's building. Let's really go big into world building. Okay. I want to talk. Cool. I want to like kind of do a little bit more research into it. Yeah, yeah. Talk yeah, about it first. I gotta tell you right now. Um, We're going Richard, big in the world building. <laughs> oh yeah. Richard loves talking about environmental narrative. Sure. And, and he should be back next time, and he he'll definitely want to yeah. talk about it. So I'd love to do that too. Yeah. So, there you go. So for this week, I think that will do it. Uh, I'm Chris, and I'm joined by Jim. I'm Jim. I'm Ben. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for coming, Ben. We yep. appreciate you being here. And uh, like I said, we we expect to have Ben here uh, uh, often because he's you know sort of the uh, an honorary member of the Backward Compatible crew. And I'm always at this pub, so it's there, convenient. There yeah. you go. We'll just we're always at this pub. We'll just, just show, show up, up and see if he's here, yeah. and then just kind of like <laughs> drag him into it. <laughs> and uh, shout out Fuck to the games. The shout out to the Fillmore Pub in downtown Plano. Thanks for hosting us. You guys are great. Come here. Yeah. And, it's, and it's, where where's the location here? Is it on 15th and 15th Street? Uh, yeah. 15th Street. Downtown Plano. Yeah, downtown Plano. Just past Plano. the guard station. So, All right. Really good stuff. Um, good to know. I didn't yeah. know where it was before until you <laughs> announced the force. Well, we're putting yet, a bag back over your head. <laughs> and yet you're here. <laughs> Thanks for joining us this week, guys. And uh, until next time, stay compatible. Peace.
Backward Compatible wants you to join the discussion. You bring a unique perspective, and dialogue makes everyone better. Leave a comment on our site, and if it's good, one of the crew members will respond to it. This time, let us know what you think about storytelling in games versus film, and how they can better embrace their forms. Thanks for listening. Until next time, stay compatible.